the Battle of Alesia or Siege of Alesia took place in September, 52 BC, around the Gallic Oppidum of Alesia, a major town center and hill fort of the Manduia tribe. It was fought by an army of the Roman Republic commanded by Julius Caesar, aided by cavalry commanders Mark Antony, Titus Labiens and Gaius Trebonius, against a confederation of Gallic tribes united under the leadership of Vercingetorix of the Arverni. It was the last major engagement between Gauls and Romans, marking the turning point of the Gallic Wars in favor of Rome. The Siege of Asia is considered one of Caesar's greatest military achievements and a classic example of siege warfare and investment. The Battle of Asia can safely be described as marking the end of Celtic dominance in France, Belgium, Switzerland and northern Italy. The battle site was probably atop Mont Auxois, above modern Elias saint rain in France, but this location, some have argued, does not fit Caesar's description of the battle. A number of alternatives have been proposed over time, among which only Show de Crotini remains a challenger today. At one point in the battle the Romans were outnumbered by the Gauls by four to one. The event is described by several contemporary authors, including Caesar himself in his Commentaria de Bello Gallico. After the Roman victory, Gaul was subdued and became a Roman province. The Roman Senate refused to allow Caesar the honor of a triumph for his victory in the Gallic War, although it did grant a general thanksgiving of twenty days. Prelude, Julius Caesar had been in Gaul since 58 BC. At the end of their consular year it was customary for consuls, Rome's highest elected officials, to be appointed proconsul by the Roman Senate and assume governorship of one of Rome's provinces. Following his first consulship in 59 BC, Caesar engineered his own appointment to Cisalpine Gaul, and Transalpine Gaul. Although the proconsular term of office is normally one year, Caesar was able to secure his post in Gaul for an unprecedented ten years. With a proconsular imperium, he had absolute authority within these provinces and had defeated, through an initially unsuccessful campaign, the Celtic tribes of northern Italy. One by one Caesar defeated Gallic tribes such as the Helvetur, the Belgi, and the Neva, and secured a pledge of alliance from many others. The ongoing success of the Gallic Wars brought an enormous amount of wealth to the Republic in spoils of war and in new lands to tax. Caesar himself became very rich since, as general, he benefited from the sale of war prisoners. But success and fame also brought enemies. The first triumvirate, a political alliance with Pompey and Crassus, came to an end in 54 BC with the deaths of Julia in childbirth and Crassus in the Battle of Cari. Without this political connection with Pompey, men dedicated to the Republic like Cato the Younger started a political campaign against Caesar, arousing suspicion and accusing him of wanting to overthrow the Republic and become king of Rome. In the winter of 54 a Euro 53 BC, the previously pacified Eburans, commanded by Ambiorix, rebelled against the Roman occupation and destroyed the 14th legion under the command of Quintus Titurius Sabinus in a carefully planned ambush. This was a major blow to Caesar's strategy for Gaul, since he had now lost about a quarter of his troops, and the political situation in Rome deprived him from receiving reinforcements. The Iburon Rebellion was the first clear Roman defeat in Gaul and inspired widespread national sentiments and revolution. It took almost a year but Caesar managed to regain control of Gaul and pacify the tribes. However, the unrest in Gaul was not over. The Gallic tribes had realized that only united could they achieve independence from Rome. A general council was summoned at Bibric through initiative of the Adui, once Caesar's loyal supporters. Only the Remi and the Lingons preferred to keep their alliance with Rome. The council declared Vercingetorix of the Arverni, commander of the united Gallic armies. Caesar was then camped for the winter in Cisalpine Gaul, unaware of the alliance made against him. The first sign of trouble came from the Carnits who killed all Roman settlers in the city of Cenabum. This outbreak of violence was followed by the slaughtering of all Roman citizens, merchants and settlers in the major Gallic cities. On hearing this news, Caesar rallied his army in haste and crossed the Alps, still buried in snow, into central Gaul. This was accomplished in record time and Caesar was able to surprise the Gallic tribes. He split his forces, 
sending four legions with Titus Labiens to fight the Sinones and the Parasur in the north while Caesar himself set out in pursuit of the Singitorics with six legions and his allied Germanic cavalry. The two armies met at the hill fort of Gergovia, where Vercingetorix held a strong defensive position. Caesar was forced to retreat to avoid utter defeat, after suffering heavy losses. In the summer of 52 BC, several engagements were fought between cavalries, with Caesar succeeding in scattering the Gallic army. Vercingetorix decided that the timing was not right to engage in a major pitched battle and regrouped in the Manduia fort of Asia. Siege and Battle Aelsia was a hilltop fort surrounded by river valleys, with strong defensive features. As a frontal assault would have been hopeless, Caesar decided upon a siege, hoping to force surrender by starvation. Considering that about 80,000 men were garrisoned in Aelsia, together with the local civilian population, this would not have taken long. To guarantee a perfect blockade, Caesar ordered the construction of an encircling set of fortifications, called a circumvallation, around Aelsia. The details of this engineering work are known from Caesar's commentaries. About 18 kilometers of 4-meter-high fortifications were constructed in about three weeks. This line was followed inwards by two 4.5-meter-wide ditches, also 4.5 meters deep. The one nearest to the fortification was filled with water from the surrounding rivers. These fortifications were supplemented with man traps and deep holes in front of the ditches, and regularly spaced watchtowers equipped with Roman artillery. Vercingetorix's cavalry often raided the construction works attempting to prevent full enclosure. The Roman auxiliary cavalry proved its value and kept the raiders at bay. After about two weeks of work, a detachment of Gallic cavalry managed to escape through an unfinished section. Anticipating that a relief force would now be sent, Caesar ordered the construction of a second line of fortifications, the Contravallation, facing outward and encircling his army between it and the first set of walls. The second line was identical to the first in design and extended for 21 kilometers, including four cavalry camps. This set of fortifications would protect the Roman army when the relief Gallic forces arrived. They were still besiegers and now also preparing to be besieged. At this time, the living conditions in Aelsia were worsening. With 80,000 soldiers and the local population, too many people were crowded inside the plateau competing for too little food. The Manduia decided to expel the women and children from the citadel, hoping to save food for the fighters and hoping that Caesar would open a breach to let them go. This would also be an opportunity for breaching the Roman lines. But Caesar issued orders that nothing should be done for these civilians and the women and children were left to starve in the no man's land between the city walls and the circumvallation. The cruel fate of their kin added to the general loss of morale inside the walls. Vercingetorix was fighting to keep spirits high, but faced the threat of surrender by some of his men. However, the relief force arrived in this desperate hour, strengthening the resolve of the besieged to resist and fight another day. At the end of September the Gauls, commanded by Commius, attempted to break in by attacking Caesar's contravallation wall. Vercingetorix ordered a simultaneous attack from the inside. None of the attempts were successful and by sunset the fighting had ended. On the next day, the Gallic attack was under the cover of night. This time they met with greater success and Caesar was forced to abandon some sections of his fortification lines. Only the swift response of the cavalry commanded by Antony and Gaius Chbonia saved the situation. The inner wall was also attacked, but the presence of trenches, which Vercingetorix's men had to fill, delayed them enough to prevent surprise. By this time, the condition of the Roman army was also weak. Themselves besieged, food had started to be rationed and the men were near physical exhaustion. On the next day, October 2, Bocassi Velornus, a cousin of Vercingetorix, launched a massive attack with 60,000 men, focusing on a weakness in the Roman fortifications which Caesar had tried to hide, but had been discovered by the Gauls. The area in question was a zone with natural obstructions where a continuous wall could not be constructed. The attack was made in combination with Vercingetorix's forces who pressed from every angle of the inner fortification. Caesar trusted the discipline and courage of his men and sent out orders to simply hold the lines. 
he personally rode throughout the perimeter cheering his legionaries. Labiente's cavalry was sent to support the defense of the area where the fortification breach was located. With pressure increasing, Caesar was forced to counterattack the inner offensive and managed to push back Vercingetorix's men. By this time the section held by Labiense was on the verge of collapse. Caesar decided on a desperate measure and took 13 cavalry cohorts to attack the relief army of 60,000 from the rear. This action surprised both attackers and defenders. Seeing their leader undergoing such risk, Labiente's men redoubled their efforts and the Gauls soon panicked and tried to retreat. As in other examples of ancient warfare, the disarrayed retreating army was easy prey for the disciplined Roman pursuit. The retreating Gauls were slaughtered, and Caesar in his commentaries remarks that only the pure exhaustion of his men saved the Gauls from complete annihilation. In Aelsia, Vercingetorix witnessed the defeat of his relief force. Facing both starvation and low morale, he was forced to surrender without a final fight. On the next day, the Gallic leader presented his arms to Julius Caesar, putting an end to the siege of Aelsia. Aftermath, Aelsia proved to be the end of generalized and organized resistance to the Roman invasion of Gaul, marking the definitive conquest of the continental Celtic people by the Roman Republic. After Aelsia, continental Gaul was subdued, becoming a Roman province and was eventually subdivided into several smaller administrative divisions. Not until the 3rd century would another independence movement occur. The garrison of Aelsia was taken prisoner as well as the survivors of the relief army. They were either sold into slavery or given as booty to Caesar's legionaries, except for the members of the Adui and Arverni tribes, which were released and pardoned to secure the alliance of these important tribes to Rome. For Caesar. Aelsia was an enormous personal success, both militarily and politically. The Senate declared twenty days of thanksgiving for this victory, but refused Caesar the honor of celebrating a triumphal parade, the peak of any general's career. Political tension increased, and two years later, in 50 BC, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, which precipitated the Roman Civil War of 49 Euro 45 BC, which he won. After having been elected consul, for each of the years of the war, and appointed to several temporary dictatorships, he was finally made dictator perpetuus, by the Roman Senate in 44 BC. His ever-increasing personal power and honors undermined the tradition-bound republican foundations of Rome, and led to the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. Caesar's cavalry commanders followed different paths. Labiens sided with the Optimates the conservative aristocratic faction in the civil war, and was killed at the Battle of Munda in 45 BC. Trebonius, one of Caesar's most trusted lieutenants, was appointed consul by Caesar in 45 BC, and was one of the senators involved in Caesar's assassination on the Ides of March, 44 BC. He was himself murdered a year later. Antony continued to be a faithful supporter of Caesar. He was made Caesar's second in command, as master of the horse, and was left in charge in Italy during much of the civil war. In 44 BC he was elected as Caesar's consular colleague. After Caesar's murder, Antony pursued Caesar's assassins and vied for supreme power with Octavian, first forming an alliance with Octavian and Marcus and Emilius Lepidus in the Second Triumvirate, then being defeated by him at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Along with his ally and lover, Queen Cleopatra, he fled to Egypt, where they committed suicide the following year. Vercingetorix was taken prisoner and languished in prison for the next five years while waiting to be exhibited at Caesar's triumph. As was traditional for such captured and paraded enemy leaders, at the end of the triumphal procession, he was taken to the Tullianum where he was said to have been strangled, although he was most likely executed in a Roman dungeon. Importance Paul K. Davis writes that Caesar Euro unregistered trademark s victory over the combined Gallic forces established Roman dominance in Gaul for the next 500 years. Caesar Euro unregistered trademark s victory also created a rivalry with the Roman government, leading to his invasion of the Italian peninsula. Identification of the site, for many years, the actual location of the battle was unknown. Competing theories focused first on two towns. Alais in the French Comte de Copyright and Alais Saint-Rain in the Cartier d'Op. 
Emperor Napoleon III of France supported the latter candidate, and, during the 1860s, funded archaeological research that uncovered the evidence to support the existence of Roman camps in the area. He then dedicated a statue to Vercingi Torix in the recently discovered ruins. Uncertainty has nevertheless persisted, with questions being raised about the validity of Elias St. Rain's claim. For example, the site is said to be too small to accommodate even revised estimates of 80,000 men with the Gallic infantry, along with cavalry and additional personnel. It is also alleged that the topography of the area does not fit with Caesar's description. In the 1960s, a French archaeologist, André Berthier, argued that the hilltop was too low to have required a siege, and that the rivers were actually small streams. Berthier proposed that the location of the battle was at Chaudes Crotini at the gate of the Jura Mountains a Euro a place that better suits the descriptions in Caesar's Gallic Wars. Roman fortifications have been found at this site. Danielle Porti, a Sorbonne professor, continues to challenge the identification of Elias St. Rain as the battle site, but the director of the Asia Museum, Laurent de Froberville, maintains that scientific evidence supports this identification. Classical historian and archaeologist Colin Wells took the view that the excavations at Elias St. Rain in the 1990s should have removed all possible doubt about the site and regarded some of the advocacy of alternative locations as passionate nonsense. Numbers involved, precise figures for the size of the armies involved, and the number of casualties suffered, are difficult to know. Such figures have always been a powerful propaganda weapon, and are thus suspect. Caesar in his De Bello Gallico, refers to a Gallic relief force of a quarter of a million, probably an exaggeration to enhance his victory. Unfortunately, the only records of the events are Roman and therefore presumably biased. Modern historians usually believe that a number between 80,000 a Euro 100,000 men is more credible. The only known fact is that each man in Caesar's legions received a call as a slave, which means at least 40,000 prisoners mostly from the besieged garrison. The relief force probably suffered heavy losses, like many other armies who lost battle order and retreated under the weapons of the Roman cavalry. References Alon, Stephen Lords of Battle, The World of the Celtic Warrior PG 169. HTTP, www.unrv comp siege of Asia PHP, a la copyright Siaman du biorum like the sage Gerasian. Retrieved May 9, 2011. Julius Caesar. Commentaria de Bello Gallico. Book 7, XC. Duis Fossis Quindesimpletes Latas, Edem Altichidem Podexit. Commentaria de Bello Gallico. Book 7, LXXII. Paul K. Davis, 100 Decisive Battles from Ancient Times to the Present, The World a Euro Unregistered Trademark S. Major Battles and How They Shaped History. 56. Hugh Schofield, France's Ancient Asia Dispute Rumbles On, BBC News, August 27, 2012. Asia and Corks Compared and Contrasted, J. F. C. Fuller, Julius Caesar, Man, Soldier, and Tyrant, Da Capo Press, 1991, ISBN 0-306-80422-0, Julius Caesar, Commentaries on the Gallic Wars, Harvard University Press. ISBN 0-674-99080-3, available online, for example English translation by W. A. McDevitt and W. S. Bonn. Adrian Goldsworthy, Roman Warfare, New York, Colin Smithonian, 2005, Account of the Battle and Surrounding Events, Livius.org Account of the Battle. External links, Official Website of Asia. In the Footsteps of Caesar and Bassini Torix. Siege of Asia Animated Battle Map by Jonathan Webb, Video, Exact Location of Asia at Elias St. Rain, Photo, Gaulish Inscription, which shows the Gaulish spelling of Allah Copyright Siar, Azia, found at the Forum in Elias St. Rain, 1st century BC, 50x 34 cm, Julius Caesar, The Siege of Asia.